In this lecture, we will be examining what I refer to as the Spanish systems of exploitation. I'm using the term exploitation primarily in an economic sense, though it should be noted that many exploitative abuses did occur under these systems. These were efforts by the Spanish to find uh, ways to profit from the territories that were claimed in the New World. As you think about each of these systems, uh, consider what each had in common and consider the problems that each system attempted to solve. After defeating the Aztecs, the Spanish began to refer to their new territories as New Spain, Nueva España. Over the next 100 years, the Spanish had its significant territory in South America, beginning with the defeat of the Inca. In the case of the Maya and the Yucatan Peninsula, it took about 170 years to subjugate the Maya, and even after the official conquest, the Spanish never really achieved true dominance over the Maya. Hernán Cortés was the first governor of New Spain, but he lacked the political skills necessary to be successful as a politician, and he made many enemies. The primary goal of the American colonies was to provide wealth to the Spanish crown. The policies the Spanish pursued were based on trade protectionism and state monopolies. Over time, the Spanish divided their New World territories into four separate vice royalties. The first, the vice royalty of New Spain, corresponded to modern-day Mexico, Central America, and the Caribbean islands. The vice royalty of Peru um, once encompassed most of um, Spanish-held South America, but it was later subdivided in the uh, 18th century into uh, two additional vice royalties. Uh, Vice Royalty Peru corresponded um, roughly with uh, the modern-day nation-states of Peru, Bolivia, and part of Ecuador. The Vice Royalty of New Granada corresponded mainly to modern-day Colombia, Ecuador, Panama, and Venezuela. And the Vice Royalty of the Rio de la Plata uh, corresponded to modern-day Paraguay, Uruguay, and Argentina. A pair of silver discoveries provided the Spanish with a source of immense wealth for several centuries. In the early 1540s, a massive silver deposit was discovered in a mountain at Potosí, which is located in present-day Bolivia. The refined silver ore was carried by pack animals to the Pacific coast. It was then shipped north by boat to Panama City, carried by pack mules across the Isthmus of Panama, and then shipped to Spain. In 1546, there was a smaller but still quite significant discovery of silver mines at Zacatecas in central Mexico. Spain I like to refer to as um, suffering from silver addiction as a result of these discoveries. It was it was easy money, um, to the crown at least, not to the people who were doing the mining. And uh, it kind of inhibited the growth of uh, industry in Spain. It was simply easier just to import more silver in terms of wealth than it was to um, promote and develop local industries. Um, it also contributed to a period of uh, uh, monetary inflation in the 16th and into the early 17th century in Europe. This influx, massive influx of tons, literally tons of silver. In um, Mexico, the mining spurred local growth. In the agricultural sector of the economy, the Spanish sought to profit from a number of commodities for Export purposes, the F Spanish focused on two principal items, sugarcane and cochineal. Sugarcane, which is pictured in the upper left-hand corner, was an important export crop on several Spanish-controlled Caribbean islands. Cochineal is actually small insects. They're rather like mites, scaly mites that feed on particular varieties of cactus. Um, once harvested, the, in the insects produce a brilliant crimson-colored liquid when crushed it was used as a textile dye. Um, this was highly prized in the 15th through 18th centuries. For domestic markets and to a lesser extent export markets, grain crops and livestock herding were important components of the economy of New Spain. Um, to protect agriculturalists back in Spain and other Habsburg lands, um, the Spanish enacted prohibitions on the importation of grapevines and olive trees. Though Eurasian diseases quickly began to take their toll on indigenous populations in the Americas, as we saw in the lecture on the Columbian Exchange, one of the greatest assets the Spanish acquired 
in the American colonies was productive labor, one of the first economic assets the Spanish needed to thus exploit was human capital. The first system the Spanish developed to exploit human capital was known as the encomienda system. An encomienda was a grant of Indians by the Spanish crown for a set period of time. It is important to note that this grant was based on people, not on land. The term comes from the Spanish verb encomendar, which means to entrust, and carries the connotations that the um, Spanish officials were entrusted with um, the lives of these people. The first encomiendas appeared in 1503, and the first encomiendas in New Spain were awarded by Cortes to loyal subordinates. The encomienda system came to an official legal end in 1720. The term encomendero refers to the encomienda recipient, who was typically an ex-conquistador, or someone who had done valuable service for the crown. These individuals possessed taxing authority, and they could order labor obligations from the Indians. Encomenderos were expected to promote conversion to Christianity, though they didn't always do so or do a particularly good job of it, and they acted as the de facto local government. The images on this slide are 16th century depictions of encomenderos by Guamen Poma de Ayala. The encomendero system was gradually phased out by the Spanish crown. There was a desire by the crown to increase revenues, and Spanish officials believed that encomenderos were not remitting the full amount they were supposed to pay. The crown also feared the growing power of encomenderos, some of whom acted like local royalty. In addition, the crown sought to address flagrant abuses of Indians by encomenderos, as some of these men were ruthless in their dealings with Native Americans. The repartimiento system replaced the encomiendas. The Spanish verb repartir means to distribute. This was a forced labor system in the Spanish colonies. Native Americans were required to work a set number of days or weeks. This work might take place on farms, in mines, or on public works projects. This system had its share of abuses as well, especially Spanish officials who demanded more days of work than Indians were required, or officials who used these laborers for their own personal land holdings or business dealings. Related to the repartimiento system was a similar concept known as the Mita system. This system was inherited from the Inca and it was most significantly used in mining operations in South America like Potosí that you see here. Communities were required to provide as much as one-seventh of their total male labor force for projects specified by the Spanish colonial government. When Mita workers were in the mines, they were required to spend their own money on food and shelter, and wages working in the mines were so low that miners, uh, in many cases, remained in perpetual debt. Miners were not permitted to leave until all debts were paid, and debts owed by a dead miner um, theoretically carried over to his children. The Hacienda system was believed by the Spanish to be an improvement on the repartimiento system. This was a system of large consolidated land holdings. The owner of an hacienda was known as the hacendado, or by the term patron. Most owners of large haciendas lived in cities near the hacienda, and they sometimes were rather infrequent visitors on their own lands. Typically they paid a, an administrator to run operations on their behalf. Peasants frequently had to purchase food and basic supplies directly from the hacendado at inflated prices. Peasants were thus often unable to leave the land due to the incurred debts. The term debt peonage describes this form of economic exploitation, which shares some characteristics with slavery, especially the inability to leave when a person wants to leave. The Casa de Contratación was an agency of the Spanish crown that attempted to control exploration, colonization, and trade in the Spanish-controlled New World. The name translates as House of Trade. This agency collected taxes and duties. It approved voyages of exploration and trade. It sold official maps, licensed ship captains, and directed commercial and maritime law. Typical taxes were 20% on goods imported into the Spanish colonies. 
though tax rates on certain goods were sometimes higher or lower depending on particular crown policies at a given time. For example, taxes might be lowered to promote imports of certain goods, while taxes might be raised on certain goods to protect domestic industries. In theory, no one sailed in Spanish waters without authorization, but in practice, smuggling occurred in much of the Spanish Empire. Finally, the trade monopolies of the Spanish crown were maintained by what was known as the flota system, which was regularly scheduled convoys across the Atlantic and Pacific. Raw materials were sent from the Americas primarily to Spain, while finished products and colonists were sent to the Americas from Spain. Goods from Asia were shipped from the port of Manila in the Philippines to Spanish ports in New Spain. Then these Asian commodities were shipped to Spain. However, the most important commodity, again, shipped to Spain was silver. And because the flota system followed predictable patterns and regular schedules, Spanish silver fleets were prime targets for Dutch, French, and English privateers. This draws to a close our look at the Spanish systems of exploitation.